Uh, good afternoon. Thanks, Brenda. <clears throat> I think Brenda and Holly must have a good sense of humour because they've given us the graveyard slot and it's the care inspector, so uh, the, the double whammy, I'm afraid. Um, but as everybody will know, um, the care inspector since um, 2019 has been given a role by the Scottish Government to be the central repository for learning reviews. And in our report published last January, it took a count of three years. So I think it was from the 5th of November 2019 up to 2022. This year's report was an annual report based on 12 or 13 months worth of learning reviews. <coughs> and that report was published at the end of um, January. And I think when we look at learning reviews, so we've got a couple of roles of care inspector, as well as being a central repository. We review the effectiveness of the process that particular partnership undertook while undertaking the review process. And at the moment, we undertake that review. We maybe call up the convener or the adult sport protection lead. We give them information or feedback in a, verbally in advance of a kind of written letter which says, here's where I think you did really some good work, and here's where I think maybe other things can be done um, slightly differently. And when I was reflecting on this presentation this morning by way of an introduction, when I was thinking about the Triennial Review Report, and this, it was interesting to note that <clears throat> in terms of the evidence that we've collected and reported on uh, in the last two reports, something we are in the region of just over 120 notifications, that's cases that have potentially had some significant concern relating to them. So we've had about 120 notifications from partnerships that they're intending to consider um, a learning review or an ICR as it was or an SER back in the day. We've looked at 27 cases that have proceeded to an, uh, an SER or a learning review and we've considered 19 other reviews conducted by another process. So sometimes cases will meet the criteria for learning review and partnerships will decide not to undertake a learning review, but they might undertake a review known as something other than a learning review. So <clears throat> there has been quite a lot of information that's come out of our way to consider as part of our published report. This year is slightly different in the respect that we, over the course of the year, there was, over the course of the 13 months that we reported on, there was only six actual reviews that were given to us uh, to consider. But we still had the data in relation to a number of notifications and my colleague Winnie will go through that in a wee bit of detail for you soon. I think just to reflect on where we're at, I think it's interesting following the discussions that we had this morning, Jamie talked about the sort of convergence of adult protection, the child protection, the transitions, the mental welfare commission reports that we've read. And there is something, it does feel like a sort of pivotal moment in time, it does feel like the sector's at a bit of a crossroads. When we've been discussing and having focus groups with partnerships about learning reviews and the processes and the challenges and what works well, you know, people are kind of feeling that <clears throat> we kind of know what we're knowing we, and the care inspector keep producing reports that kind of are broadly similar to, to last year and say the same thing and stuff. So it does feel like a bit of a seminal moment for learning abuse and for the care inspector in terms of how we transform from just commenting on events that have passed to thinking about how we can more support the sector to generate improvement. And so there is something for me today that I'll return to at the end by way of a request to the sector. Care inspector are thinking about how we can make that shift and it would be good to get people's thoughts about it or ideas about that. I have some myself as I've shared with you at the end. Um, but um, that's really all I wanted to say by way of an introduction and give you some understanding of the scale and the scope of the work that we look at. I'll pass it to Winnie who will take you through some of the kind of main themes, some of the things that have come out, there, some of the commonalities that are coming out um, and we're happy to take questions at the end. Good afternoon everybody. As Mike said, my name is Bonnie Burke and I'm a strategic inspector with the Care Inspector. So I'm going to go through the, the main elements of the report. Just to let you know that the report is available on our website if people haven't already seen that. 
As Michael said, this report covers 13 months. It's the first of our annual reports, and we've decided that in the future we are going to do annual reports. Unlike the triennial review, which had quite a bit of data to give some themes um, across the reviews that were received, because of the 13-month the period, we don't actually have as much breadth of information as we have for the triennial review. But we felt it would still be valuable to have something published so that there's still a lot of interesting elements within that for the sector to look at. In terms of the evidence base, what produced the evidence for the report, we used three main elements. The first was the analysis of the, the notifications and the completed reviews received during the 13-month reporting period. We also gathered information from a survey which we sent out to all the Animal Protection Committees or Protection Committees. Um, and we also got, um, we had five focus groups which were held with national groups across um, uh, across Scotland and we got uh, a lot of valuable, very rich information actually from those focus groups. They were represented by almost all of the, the protection committees and it really proved to be for us, uh, a, a, gave us a great understanding of the kind of experiential um, process of undertaking learning reviews. In terms of the notification summaries that we received, we received 31 summaries during the period that we're reporting on. So the report focuses on those 31 notifications, as well as the six completed reviews. As I said before, because of the small number that we received, the report can't really comment on or identify widespread themes or trends, but there's still a lot of value in that report. I think it's worth noting for, for people that the 31 notifications actually came from just 10 adult protection committees, which is just a third of the adult protection committees. So that's something that we're going to, to continue to monitor because obviously you would think that there would be a kind of general even spread uh, nationally in terms of notifications being sent, sent in. We're going to come back and look at the, the spread of notifications we received um, in, a, in a, a wee bit. Of the six completed reports that we received, Three were learning reviews, two were SCRs, and one was a multi-agency review. Despite the move to, to learning reviews, we still expect to see in our next annual report some SCRs reported on because there has been a backlog, there have been delays with some of the SCRs, so there are still that are st some of that are still outstanding. The key messages from the notifications that we received. As with the triennial report, self-neglect, self-harm and neglect were the most prominent primary types of harm. In this annual report, we saw a slight rise in self-neglect as a primary type of harm. And this resonated with the discussions that we had at the focus groups where it was reflected by APCs that this is something that they also see rising. Self-harm had also risen slightly as a primary type of harm. The main reason given for considering going to review in the notification we received was firstly death of an adult, but mostly that opportunities were missed to protect adults when they were looking at cases. Also, identifying risk and improving communication were cited as reasons why cases were put forward for review. Again, echoes what we saw in the triennial review, so very little change um, from one review to another. Just over half of the notifications related to adults 65 and over, and again, that probably won't come as a surprise to this, this audience. In terms of the leading service types, alcohol, substance misuse, dementia and frailty were the leading service types. And for the first time within this category, we saw a rise in this being linked to capacity issues. So again, we see capacity starting to become more prominent in cases as well. Almost all of the notifications related to harm in the adult's own home. And the review notifications show that there was robust consideration given to whether or not a review should be carried out, and if so, what type of review it should be. We're actually very pleased to see the detail in the review notifications about the discussion that took um, place in determining whether to go to review. What we didn't see, and probably what could be improved, there wasn't much documented in the notifications as to how much 
previous learning from other case reviews had been considered in the cases they were looking at. However, when we spoke to people at the focus group, it was obvious that this played a part in their discussions, but it needed to be clarified in the notifications sent out to us. Where cases didn't move to uh, a, a, any type of review, the primary rationale given was that no new learning had been identified, which is absolutely fine and fits with the, the new guidance. One gap for us, however, as the main repository for reviews, is that whilst we were receiving reviews where they had been learning reviews, any other review activity that was undertaken, i.e. a multi-agency review, single agency review, etc., we just weren't getting those submissions and it's part of our role and responsibility to gather information not just from learning reviews but from all types of reviews so that we can share that on a national basis. So that's something we're going to, to reiterate to um, partnerships. What um, we will be talking about later in Next Steps is the best way to try and do that and Mike will, will go over that with you at the, the end. In terms of the key messages from the actual reports that we got submitted, when we analyse them, as Mike said, when we get them and we analyse them, they're analysed by two strategic inspectors, one leads on the analysis and one peer reviews it. And it was felt that the overall quality of the completed reports that we received um, were generally good or very good. We saw different methodologies used across the six reviews. All of them were effective, so there wasn't one methodology that proved more effective than another, another one. All of them that we saw were effective, and they delivered the outcomes that the committees wanted and set out in their, their terms of reference. We saw appropriate multi-agency representation in review activity, and discussion of the focus groups reinforced that multi-agency multi work continues to improve. We saw little reference, however, to trauma-informed practice in the majority of the reviews that we received. Again, discussion of focus groups showed us that people were using the principles of trauma-informed practice, but in terms of it being firmly embedded, this was still under development. There was certainly an enthusiasm to have embedded, but people wanted to do it right, do it once and do it right, rather than take a piecemeal approach to embedding trauma-informed practice. And again, Mike's going to talk a little bit about trauma-informed practice in the, the next steps. Oh, sorry. New technology. In the completed review, reviews that we got, three external reviewers were used and three internal reviewers were used. And we saw that as with the, the children's learning reviews, access to external reviewers could be difficult. There's an ongoing national discussion around the accessibility of accredited people with the skills and knowledge to undertake reviews. We also heard very clearly at the focus groups about the impact that using internal reviewers has. This is due to capacity and resource issues and often the role of being an internal reviewer will fall, fall to the people with the most responsibility and the most in their diary. And initial discussions have started looking at this issue because it is a, a pressing issue for the partnerships. Within the reviews, a number of recommendations or identified themes focused on legal literacy. They focus on the knowledge of the applicable legislation, particularly adults with incapacity, and this continues to be an area for improvement. It should also be noted that only two of the reports that we looked at within the reporting period were published. Again, this could be seen as limiting national learning, and discussion is underway as to how this gap can be plugged. Going back to the review notifications, the primary review, as I said, was for consideration of a review was the death of an adult. And of the notification received, nine adults had died. 22 of the 31 notifications came from three partnerships. <coughs> One partnership accounted for a third of all the notifications that were received. So as you can see, this certainly stands out as something that we should continue to monitor. 
We saw in the notifications that there was proportionate decision making at notification stage. And from the focus groups that we held, we found out that it was the new guidance that supported this proportionate approach. It also explains to us why we received fewer notifications and fewer learning reviews than we thought we might get. In terms of observations on the six reports, most of the review reports demonstrated effective decision-making processes with very good governance arrangements supporting this. Focus group discussions reinforced that gov governance arrangements were robust and very supportive of the review process. As stated before, the lack of knowledge around ASP legislation, policies and procedures was evident in three of the reports submitted. Again, a recurring issue and one potentially worthy of national discussion. <coughs> the majority of partnerships have got appropriate training and development, but it still remains a recurring problem, so it's something that has to be looked at. The focus groups also raise the importance of good legal support to the committees, particularly given the rise in the external scrutiny by legal bodies on published reviews. Good legal advice obviously strengthens the decision making in the review process. In terms of recommendations, we acknowledge that within the reviews that we receive, depending on the methodology that's used, we may not see recommendations, we may see general themes that are presented to the APC at the end of the report. However, where we did see recommendations, many of them were not smart. In discussion with focus groups, there was a, a, a feeling that, that there should be something that supports them in having consistency in how recommendations are reflected and recorded in review reports, and that's something that is a part of ongoing discussions. Again, with some of the recommendations we saw, some of them identified learning that was worthy of national dissemination. However, as stated before, because so few are published, this limits their impact. Where there were national recommendations in published reviews, it wasn't clear whether discussions had been had with the sector as a whole before making a national uh, recommendation or whether or not there had been discussion with Scottish Government before the publication came out. Impact of reviews on practice. As uh, the care inspector, we get very little information about the impact of the reviews on practice. As Mike said, at the end of analysing a review report, we do meet with the Health Protection Committee convener, generally the lead officer, and we take that opportunity to look at whether or not the improvement plans that have been put in place are working, and whether or not they can give us some information on the impact of the review, of, of the review on practice. One of the things that we found out when we had our focus groups and also something that showed very clearly through the survey results that we got back is that whilst learning reviews are at a, they're in their infancy at the moment and there's no, there's no real evidence in terms of being able to measure the impact that learning reviews have had and neither there should be at this stage. However, they felt that there should be some form of method that's available to APCs and protection committees that they can measure and evaluate the processes. As I say, it's just the beginning, and we're not looking at the moment for any data related to impact at the moment, but there's an enthusiasm to start looking at a national way of measuring and evaluating the impact of learning reviews. We heard in the focus groups that there has been increased involvement of operational staff throughout the review process and it came across very clearly that having operational staff involved from the very beginning of the review process right through to the end has helped embed recommendations and increase the understanding of learning reviews within the staff groups. A number of partnerships have seen the benefit of aligning their adult and child learning review guidance and that's provided many benefits for them <coughs> including the ability to identify cross-cutting themes across the two. And again this is something that Mike will touch on in next steps. And I shall pass you on to Mike for those next steps. <coughs> Thank you.
probably should just ask, are there any questions in relation to any of the sort of information that's gone? Because I'm kind of going to come off of that and kind of veer on to kind of, you know, the next steps. But if anybody's got any kind of questions, queries about any of the information, if you can just shout it up, uh, if, if there's not, I'll sort of crack on. I think <clears throat> there are, and Jamie talked about it just before the break, there are discussions among Scottish government colleagues, policy teams, other protection, child protection, about the similarities that are arising become more clear now since we've started reporting on what learning reviews are finding by way of adult sport protection. There are a lot of similarities in relation to what we are finding with our children's colleagues. And I guess at the same time that we were beginning to recognise that in the care inspector, I think the Scottish Government were beginning to see it in our reports, the sector were beginning to feel it and begin to reflect that to us in some of the focus groups that Winnie and Brenda attended and organised with the sector. As I said right at the start, it does feel like everybody's kind of saying, you know, <clears throat> there's a potential maybe need to kind of review, have a broad look at the commonalities across the two child protection, where we could make maybe make systems more efficient, where we could maybe join them up, um, and where we can maybe kind of do joint work to address issues similar across the, the two, two sectors. So I guess uh, those discussions, when I was thinking, or when we were thinking about the next steps, taking account of all that, as I said, it's kind of just about us encouraging discussions across the sector. And the other view was that there were a number of kind of organisations across the sector that were considering this, thinking about this, beginning to identify it. There were early discussions between the Child Protection Learning Review Liaison Group uh, and the Adult Protection adult support protection sector that we were involved in and stuff. So just in terms of next steps, we felt that it was important that those conversations translated into a plan that should be visible for the sector um, so that people working in adult support protection could see when they were thinking about learning reviews and a way forward, what the joint issues were, what the Scottish Government what the care inspector, what people were planning to do by way of an approach at joining the two sectors up. And just in terms of kind of setting out the scope, setting out what that would include, setting out time scales, setting out leads for particular bits of work, we felt that it was important that those conversations translated into something meaningful, a plan that people like the people here gathered in this room could see and take account of and can hold us to account in terms of progress and stuff. So it was important for us when we were thinking about learning reviews that those conversations translated into a plan. So hence, that was one of our kind of three next steps that we reached when we were thinking about uh, what had to be done on the back of, of our report or what the, some of the more important things were. The other thing, I guess, when he touched on sort of some of the trauma-informed what can we know that, the, that that's an emerging key area of practice in adult support protection? We know that everybody's cited on it, we know that there's a push on it. Um, and our kind of recommendation by way of learning reviews takes account of a few things, I guess, and gently sort of pushes us, keeps us going in that general direction of having trauma-informed organisations. When we read the reviews, when they touched on it, while we see staff that we speak to say we welcome learning reviews because ICRs and SCRs are scary, the focus on deficits, the focus on risks, the focus on why didn't you do that? And as you know, if you're a social worker and somebody on your caseload dies or comes to significant harm, we know that that's not just traumatic for the service, for the adult who's died or the family and the friends of that person, we know that's traumatic for staff. And we know that that's traumatic for organisations and that it's felt all the way up and down the spine of an organisation. But what we weren't seeing, so while we're seeing person-centred approaches to learning reviews, you know, nice ways of engaging staff and stuff, what we'll probably want to encourage by way of, when we are looking at learning reviews, what we'd like to encourage is seeing evidence, clearer evidence of what partnerships have done to support staff that have been through that, what you've done to support adults that have survived 
a terrible experience and sort of how that's been embedded into the culture of a partnerships approach to learning the views. And in order to do that, it was really timely because um, there's a quality improvement framework out for trauma-informed organisations that, you know, the Scottish Government have had a hand in designing collaboratively with NES and COSLIN, the Improvement Service, and importantly, the Resilience Learning um, Partnership. And all these people had combined to put their strengths together to develop this framework. And I think it's a really excellent framework. And I think it should be on the radar of APCs to have a look at this framework. And I think it should be on the radar of conveners and people who undertake learning reviews to have a look at that framework. Lift some of the illustrations of what a good trauma-informed organisation includes. Build it into how you're taking forward learning reviews. And just even more generally, just how you're building in trauma-informed practice into your workforce and building up that resilience for trauma-informed practice, I suppose. So, <clears throat> when me and Winnie were thinking about what next steps might look like by way of our report that we've just published, we thought that that was a really, really important and critical area to put a bit of commentary around. I guess, and finally, said right at the start that it's a bit of a seminal moment for the care inspector. In focus groups, people were I think rightfully sort of challenging us. If we're going to be absolutely honest, and people are kind of challenging us as maybe too strong a work, but people were suggesting they want more from the care inspector by way of support with improvement. Do you know, we could, so our processes, when you think about our processes at a standard moment, we're a repository, we get the data, we analyze the data, <coughs> the feedback to conveners and the like, and the people that do the chairs about the accuracy of the processes and what's really good and areas for improvement, the strengths and stuff. But I guess when you take a step back, it's all retrospective, it's all focusing on what's come and gone. And when we were in focus groups and in the discussions with the Child Protection Liaison Committee and in discussions with Jamie and our team and everything, people are kind of saying, well, can, can, is it possible to get a bit more out of the care inspector by way of a nudge about self-evaluation, about help with improvement work. One of the things that comes across in the triennial report and this report is that partnerships will say to us, we don't, so we do learning reviews, they're costly, they're resourceful, they take capacity off the front line. And we put all the recommendations into rattle protection committees improvement plans. But it's difficult to know, it's difficult like we can't be sure, we can't get a level of assurance that we need that those things have made a difference. Because there might have been a hundred ingredients that combined on that day to make that adult at risk, that conversed, that made, you know, that maybe caused the death of that adult, that might never come again. So the strength of, like whether the measures have impacted or not, you know, is, is pretty sort of a complicated. So I think, if I can just kind of take a step back from the learning review and just I'll reflect a bit of work that we're planning to do with adults for protection sector and say, I'm wondering, this is the beginning, the beginning, early thinking for me, but I'm beginning to think that some of this might apply to how we go forward with learning with you. You maybe know or you might not know that we are currently working with the National Implementation Group to co-design or to work together to design the quality improvement framework for adults for protection. Um, and that will, as a self-evaluation model, <clears throat> and that's a model that will demonstrate good practice and is, an e and is based on EFQM, and is a model that you can use if you're striving for excellence across, par across partnerships. So, we're working to develop that quiff. We are about to put invites out to every partnership in Scotland to come and join us, either in Dundee, Glasgow, or Edinburgh, and you'll get invites soon. Because we're in, we are interested when we're designing the quiff, quiff, a quality improvement framework is based on illustrations of what good looks like, what good practice looks like. So that's not the care inspector's interpretation of good practice. It should be ours because we've done national inspections and we kind of know what good practice is. But it's also about engaging you guys and saying, have we got this right? Is the language right? Is the theme right? Is the kind of emphasis right? Does it feel right? 
So we're about to embark on that process and that will help us to kind of design this quality improvement framework. And then on the back of that, when we're engaging with you on the days, we're going to ask partnerships to volunteer to test that out. In a, in a, so we will lift the areas in that cliff relating to early intervention, prevention, trauma-informed practice. And we are looking for about six partnerships to say, come and test that out with us. And the mutual benefit for any partnership that offers that to us will be that in advance of any field work, I'm aiming to take you away for a day or two to introduce you to an, an, an improvement service, either from Healthcare Improvement Scotland, who have yet to confirm that they can support the day, but certainly the Care Respectors Improvement Team will support the day. And we will go through the quiff, and we will talk about improvement methodology, we will talk about how it relates to the quiff, how you may, might set measures to accurately determine whether the measures that you put in place have any impact and stuff. And then, so we'll do that jointly, and we'll go out and do the support and self-evaluation jointly. When I think about that as an approach, it's kind of like, you know, that could end up being really good bit of work, or it could maybe be end up, it's maybe just not quite well, it needs to be, but I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, and it's probably not been done before. Um, but I, I feel in my heart of hearts that it's the right way. Because people have a perception about the game spectrum. It's all about scrutiny, it's all about scrutiny. This begins to kind of draw on a more of a commitment towards improvement. And it chimes with learning reviews. And if there's anything in that approach that works or that is good, that quality improvement framework, there's no reason why when I can, when somebody who's chairing the learning review is thinking about the recommendations, the recommendations that apply to health, the recommendations that apply to social work or the police or other organisations, there's no reason why that quality improvement framework at the end of the day can't be used as a tool, as a template to begin to measure the, recommend, the success or otherwise of those recommendations that partnerships apply. So there's maybe something in how we approach this work with the CWIF and with partnerships that we can apply for learning reviews that will begin to take us in another direction just away from commenting retrospectively about the quality of work in relation to learning reviews into a model that still does that but provides a bit more, a bit something else beyond that that encourages improvement work and supports improvement work in practice. Sounds great, but we are probably in the same financial position as every other council at the moment. I don't have a team of 20 people just sitting waiting to get the green light for this work or anything like that. And if we do that, it means something else that somebody else is asking us to do. We might have to kind of sit on the touch line for a while. But that's my thinking. That's the early point of my thinking. Um, I really I, I said at the start, I think, the sector is at a crossroads. And the care inspector is part of the sector. And we should collaborate with the sector and we probably, going forward, have to think about more a transformational approach rather than something that we're doing. There are currently internal meetings in the care inspector with my children's colleagues, my equivalent in the childcare side of things. We are beginning to think about what we can do within the current envelope to support learning reviews and learning and improvement and our existing role and so we will challenge ourselves to respond to some of the feedback that we've had um, and we will keep you posted. <laughs>